Hello everyone, a warm welcome to Berlinale Talents, a warm welcome also here to the How Hebel am Ufa. Um, big pleasure to have you here with us um, in our nice new round. Um, it's nice to have you closer. Um, this is also the year of mistakes, as you heard, or as you might have read, or you can read it here. Uh, not necessarily, of course, the mistakes in the sessions, but in this bigger dimension of uh, what a mistake means, also in terms of experimentation, in terms of uh, trying out something new, when a plan went differently. And all those kind of stuff uh, led us to something which we put into a new focus, which is the focus on research, because research is a moment uh, in production which often happens, both in fiction and non-fiction, um, but uh, it is also a moment in time which we wanted to stress and look deeply into how research is done, what kind of methods. And I won't give away anything here because this session is partly also about this, um, but I'm happy to have you here and there's another session uh, coming up in the next days. Um, so if you're interested, just stay with us, of course, but without any further ado, now I'm just opening the floor to Jamila Granitz. Thank you very much for the moderation. Thank you, Florian. Um, hello and welcome also from my side. Good afternoon to the session on mining for the real uh, with the Austrian documentary filmmaker Niklas Geierhalter. And before I introduce him in detail and we totally delve into the topic of research, I would like us to watch a clip from his most recent work, Erde, Earth, a portrait of the Earth in the Anthropocene. So please, clip one. Niklas, thank you very much for taking the time for the session. Um, just to quickly introduce you, you are a director, screenwriter and cinematographer from Austria working in the field of documentary filmmaking since 1992. Um, with a large array of award-winning films defined by a very, very elaborate particular style and visual language that we will go further into later in this talk, um, you're an autodidact and you do have your own production company um, and your credits include over the years that has been part of Berninane Forum in 2015 and Homo Sapiens that was part of Forum 216 and this year you are back with Erde Earth, um, a portrait of the earth in the Anthropocene that we have just seen a clip from. So a film in which you investigate the earth in the Anthropocene, the epoch of significant human impact on the earth which is interesting itself as um, a concept, I find. So the idea of um, researching this epoch, is it something you do in all your work or in many of your work, or is it something you specifically delved into within the process of researching Earth? Well, <laughs> I mean, for documentary research, it's, um, it's, it's like the foundation of the film, you know? It's, it's, um, but I have to say that I'm not doing the research myself. Um, I usually have a team of people working with me because, um, first of all, it's, it's very time consuming. And, um, but I'm, I'm very much aware of the fact that, this, that the research really shapes, shapes, the, um, shapes, in, shapes the film in the end. Like this scene that we have just seen, if this is the result of the research, if we wouldn't have found this location, it wouldn't be there. It's very simple. So that's why, for example, the two the two colleagues of mine who did the research um, throughout the period of three years' time, um, they, are, they are mentioned in the credits as uh, assistant directors because it's really it's a close relationship. And, and usually when I start um, to approach a topic, I mean, yes, there is a rough idea of how it could look like, of where I want to get. Usually I have uh, in my mind um, images of, of locations and then, then we're trying to get as close as possible to this. But um, uh, there are permanent, uh, it permanently changes. And, and, and what I also do is, as soon as some location is confirmed, we try to go there, shoot a scene, shoot, um, try, try and error, edit it, and, and then the research continues. So over the spirit of the three years that this um, shooting of this film took, we were always shooting, researching, editing, and again, researching, shooting, editing, permanently in communication, and it really, it grows like this. And when you compare the result to the first script that you have to write for the funders just to explain them to get money, 
there is not very much in common except the big topic. So, and I think it's important because if you write a script for the funders, it's just an idea of, of how the world could look like, but you didn't have the time to really research it. And you absolutely have to stay open to, to allow yourself and to allow the film to change, to adapt to reality. So is shooting itself part of the research in your case? Because I guess there is many filmmakers who have their research process, even do research shoots, and then start um, with the actual production. But as you are in this circuit that you just described, is shooting, editing, um, and the film material that finally ends up in the film are already and also part of the process of researching. Would you say so? Well, I mean, research in that with this particular film, researching means um, trying to get access to locations, mm -hmm. finding locations and getting access. Um, but with two exceptions, none of our team has visited these locations before. So you get a time slot, like you have five days in this mine for shooting. And within these five days, you have to find protagonists, you have to see what kind of topic is there, you have to find stories. So, um, yeah, it's a little bit like, like hunting for stories all the time. And, but, but I like this, and I, I made the experience with further films when you go to a location before and, and try to find protagonists and arrange, okay, I will be, come back in like two months and then we'll shoot. It's, it usually doesn't work so well because this person is stressed and then there are these expectations and so on and so on. And like, when you come to a place like this, like in California, for example, I mean, the workers knew that there would be a film team, but that was it. And they were basically sitting on their machines and we had five days of shooting. And the first two days we only took this kind of general shots and the aerial shots and all this kind of stuff. And we were just visible for them, they saw us. and. During the lunch breaks, we started to talk to them, and in the beginning, they were very distanced and didn't know what we were doing, but then in the end, okay, we were talking, and they found out that I'm interested in their work, in their daily life, in their, in their job, and in their opinion. And they said, okay, that's new for us, because usually the media don't talk to us. And um, for the first interview, we had to kind of convince the person, and the next day, they were standing in a row and said, okay, please film me, and I'm on this big truck, and I have something to say. So I think it's also very much, a question of the approach, of how you approach the people. Just, just be honest to them, don't stress them, and give them the idea that you're really interested in what they are saying. So this is all part of the research. It all goes, I mean, researching and filming is, I couldn't separate it, you know? It's not that we prepare a scene or a location and then we just take the shots one after the other. So, Space and location is obviously something that is very important in most of your work. So would you say this is where it starts? You have this thing for abandoned spaces, for closed spaces that people usually don't have access to. And entering those spaces, you immediately, as you say, you start shooting because you're limited in time and you're limited um, by the outer configurations of that place. So then you go into and you come from a global level and go into depth, how is that important to you? Because obviously there would be the um, option to do it the other way around, search for stories, characters, ideas, and then see where to find them. Yeah, but it's true what you mentioned. I mean, space and time, that's it. I mean, actually, I think it's, it's two different types of research. The one is the research from the office with the aim to opened it space and, and to get the time frame to shoot in it, to find the space and to, to talk to the responsible people and to convince them to let us filming. And the other research is, is really on the location once you're there and I think it's more honest. I think it's more honest like this. Um, I, I, I really, I prefer, mm, I mean, when, when I come to a location, of course I know what ide ideally I would like to get or what images I'm looking for, or what kind of stories ideally um, could be told. And I have um, questions in my mind to ask the protagonists, but the best thing that can happen if, is um, if they surprise me, if there are new topics that I didn't think of, and you have to stay open for this. So, you know, it's always, I mean, research is, research is the first step, and then reality maybe even stronger than the research somehow. 
Oh, the original idea you had in mind. Yeah, yeah but the original idea that I have in mind, it's I mean, a, yeah. it's, I try to, 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 to not narrow down the idea as much as possible. I mean, when we wrote the script for Earth, this wasn't very much. It was like, okay, big construction signs, big mines, we move more surface material than, than the nature does, and that was it. And then we had some, some kind of uh, dummy locations, and everybody in the, fun, the funders and the TV stations, they knew that these locations are exchangeable, and I think most of them were, in the end, I don't think even one state, because research started when, when, when the money was there. But um, I think, for me, this is, it's just life, you know? I mean, even from when you start an application until you start shooting, it's, it's months, it may be years, so the world is changing permanently, so why would you stick to a script that is just not accurate anymore? Hmm. Um, by the way, we would very much invite the audience also to get, engage with the discussion. There is a mic that is wandering around, so whenever you have a question, just raise your hand. Is there the microphone, please? In the very front. <laughs> Is that, is that, is that, that? Mike Cube. Hi. <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah, I was wondering about, I mean, you were mentioning that you started the research um, uh, first after you had the money. Um, but what about your other projects? Uh, I mean, when you started actually getting investors uh, and actually people giving you money for your ideas, how was the research um, process then? Okay, I mean, actually, it's, it's two or three stages, at least with the film funding in Austria. You can apply for research funding. This is a little bit of money for making a very first draft, the first research. Then you come back and, and you can either apply for a bigger research with a bigger team or go to the, to the project funding already. And um, of course, this first step of the um, basic research is necessary. But then, um, I mean, I'm always making clear that maybe the film will look like this, maybe it will look completely different. The only thing that I can guarantee is I'm doing the best to make the best out of this topic. And um, I know that I'm a little bit in a privileged position because I did several films before and there is a kind of a trust, they know there will be some film in the end. I know that this is not the kind of um, advice that I can give for, for, for filmmakers who have to apply for first or second movies because especially, especially the television stations, as I understand, they want to be on the safe side. They want to read the script and in the end they... If the film is better than the script, they will not say anything, they will like it. But if they think the film is worse than the script, they will complain because this is not what we ordered. We got this reaction with some other project. We didn't order this. Hey, it's documentary. I mean, things may fail. So, for me, um, I think it has to be lively and, and, and um, as I told you, it's, with the funders it's no problem, with television stations you need to know the um, commissioning editors and this is a question of trust, basically. But yeah, how, does, how did it change for you over the years? I guess for the first films it was different or maybe it wasn't because you had the freedom of just doing without having expectations, you know? Over the last 20 years, I guess you have different facilities to research. Also, um, material has changed. You're now shooting digital, whereas back then you were working on film. Um, how does that also affect the whole process? Uh, yeah, I mean, the world has completely <laughs> changed since I started filmmaking, although it's not that long ago. But, um, I mean, my first films, there was not so much research involved. They were all about this uh, a space, like... Bosnia and Herzegovina, we just went there and, and stayed there for a year and shoot a movie or the film about Pripyat. It was very hard to get access to this sonar on this Chernobyl power plant, but once we got this, it was easy, you know, it, it's just, it was one authority that needed to say yes. With those films like, like Earth, where you're shooting on many different locations in the world, you need to convince more people, it's just more complex and, and I have the feeling that the companies there they are less and less trusting the media. They don't want the media in, especially all those mines. I mean, it's actually, it's, it's a few big mining companies who have their operations all over the world. And um, uh, 
they are somehow afraid, or at least they have the feeling they can only lose if they if they collaborate with the media in some way. That's the impression that I had. And um, very often, I mean, often we we got simple answer like, no, there is no chance, we couldn't let you in. But most often, and this was the annoying thing, was that um, they didn't even forbid us. They just said, okay, this is, we got your request, it will take some time and we will come back to you and then you write them after three months and they say, yes, but we have to ask this person and we have to ask this commission. And in the end, they just, they don't even say no, they just uh, kind of, you know, it, it stretches into eternity and at some point the time ran out and I couldn't even blame them for saying uh, no, you know. They didn't even not allow us to get in, they just never gave an answer or never gave a definite answer. This is a, a strategy that we found very often right now. Watching Earth, one could get the idea that you choose very um, specific geographic locations um, and mines. And in yesterday's Q&A, you actually um, also talked about how those configurations are not so much about, um, in this case, only having mines from the global north, for example. But for you, it was a lot about the dimension of um, technique, of um, industry, and also a dimension of materials being moved. And then you were also bound to the ability of shooting um, or being able to shoot in different locations. So. Um, is it a combination of chance and ideas and um, also large-scale industries, how like this configuration that ended up in the film um, came about? Absolutely. I mean, in the end, for example, this, I don't know, what we shot in, in California, we could have shot on many locations in the world because in big construction sites, you find them all over. This was the one where we got the access because the son of the, of the company, of this earth-moving company, he just likes film and he said okay cool why not you know that's how we ended up in California and the same is with many other locations in the film we were looking for a copper mine all over the world and I would have shot it anywhere and after a lot of negative answers there was this mine in Spain which is not a very big mine but again there was somebody at the press office who thought he would like to trust us and, and that's what he did so um, I'm trying to find the locations where I can tell the story, but these locations, they are sometimes not uniquely on, on, on one, one specific space in the earth. You have these kind of locations everywhere, and um, in the end we were lucky to, to find those locations where we could film, and it's, it is not balanced regarding, regarding the globe, you know, but um, this wasn't the point. The point was just to show how human activities change the scape of the land, and and um, this is happening everywhere anyway, so, so I think people, I mean, so, some locations are specific, for example, of course, but, but many of them are exchangeable, and I think people understand it like this. Did you shoot episodes that didn't end up in the film? Pardon? Did you shoot episodes that didn't, didn't end happen. up yes, in yes, the film? Yes, yes, we did yeah. shoot episodes yeah. that didn't end up in the film, and we did, I mean, yeah, okay, we tried, it didn't work, good enough. And of course, there are episodes that we didn't even shoot, that didn't have, end up in the film just because we didn't have the access or because it didn't happen. But at some point, you have to work with, with the scenes that you have, and otherwise you could continue forever. Is there any questions so far? Yeah. I would be interested in how much you use social media, maybe, because you also said five days of shooting is not a long time to get, build trust in a relationship with the protagonist or for interviews, but you might be able to find them online as soon as you know the location, and do you usually contact them and try to research? You them? mean the protagonists? Yeah. No, no. No, I mean, once, once we get the green light for a specific location, of course, I try to find as many uh, images on the internet, but it's more about the location to, to get an idea of what is going on there. But I think you wouldn't find specific people and also what if you find them and arrange with them and then you are on the location and the next guy is much more interesting, you know. I, I wouldn't even like to be limited like this. Mm -hmm. I think for me those days or maybe it's a week of, of shooting in one location where you really in the beginning you know nothing and then you get used to the routine and you try to understand how things work and how people think and you know you have a limited period of time 
that's also a fun part, you know. It's that's really this. I mean, in some other in some other episode, one of the workers is talking about the adrenaline. He says when he's working in a quarry, he's full of adrenaline because it's dangerous, and he's working with the big equipment, and the false stones could fall down. With film shooting, it's a bit the same. It, it, it's you have to stay interested, also, you know. I don't want to know too much. I want to have the feeling that, like the audience, I get to this location and I'm exploring and I'm trying to find my way and I'm trying to understand things and trying to meet people and talk to them. And of course, I'm not alone. There are interpreters involved, there is production manager, so we are a team of maybe four or five people usually. Um, but this process is important and it's also the way of approach that the people on, on the side, they, they see how we work, they see that we are really looking around and talking to people, trying to find somebody. We don't enter the mine and just try to find this one person that we had the contact before on Facebook. I wouldn't like to work like this. There's a question in the back. You can throw the mic if you want to. Yeah, yeah. it's it's a ball. To... It's an awesome throw. <laughs> okay, hi. Thanks uh, for being here and taking time. Um, I had a question about rights, maybe that's a little boring, but um, like all those construction workers there, did you have to get specific releases from each and every person or only the people that spoke or were seen for a certain amount of seconds or minutes? How does that work with clearing rights for people, talent? Yeah, this is always kind of a gray zone. Of course, we have to release forms of everybody who is talking in the film and then with the crowd, you know, there are different regulations and basically everybody knows that we are filming there and everybody knows that if he or she doesn't want to be filmed, she could just move out of the frame. Everybody likes to be in the frame. Um, you can't get release forms of 20 workers, especially not when they are really there to work. So once they had the conversation in the morning, they jump on their machines and, and they go because time is money. But, um, you know, I try to see things differently. I think that if, if we were fair to the people and they knew that they were filmed, so why should anybody make a problem in the end? I was thinking it's more for um, clearing rights for TV stations. Do they ever get worried? Well, the TV stations, they expect us to clean the rights. And if, if there should be a problem in the end, they would come back to us and we would have to solve it. So we try to, to, clean, to clear the rights as good as we can. But with documentary, there's always, you know, you can't, you can't clear all the rights when you're shooting in the public. But we never had a problem with this. Cool, thank you. There's a question in the very back. Hello, thank you. Uh, do you have any advice for people engaging with uh, very sort of socially sensitive topics for the first time uh, with, with their film? Like what? Like, for example, I'm preparing a film now with a cast of 20 Down Syndrome dancers. How would you advise me to approach it in a way, emotionally or...? How do you feel you want to approach it? I don't know, I wanted to ask you as well if you have any advice. <laughs> I don't think I can answer that for you because this is part of your directing a film. Yeah, but uh, you know, most of my work usually has a very staged element. I also came to the lecture because I haven't worked on any dogs before. Mm -hmm. So I thought uh, it would be interesting to ask you that question. <laughs> I, I like staged elements. <laughs> Just continue like this. <laughs> but not with meaning, I mean, what is a staged element for you? If, it's, if you're talking about kind of reenactment or this kind of stuff, I don't like this, but seeing reality as a stage and framing it within, within the lens of a camera, that's how I usually work. And this, usually that's a good, I mean, I would start from this, but I can't, to be honest, I can't tell you how to start because really it has to come from your heart somehow, you know? That's, that's a good enough answer, thank you. <laughs> there is one here and then in the very front. I saw it's just... Do you have any t 
do you have any tips for uh, gaining access or ways that you and your team persuade people? I mean, there are some people that say no, but what about people who say no, but you can sense that they might change their mind? Is there anything, are there any ways that you, I don't know, get into people's heads or, or <laughs> do work that, that enables them to say yes? Um, I mean, I think it is absolutely important to stay honest. To say honestly what kind of film you are preparing, why you are applying for scening in this location, what you're expecting from this. Maybe this will lower your chances that they will say yes, but if they say yes, it's, it's better, you know? Mm. That's what we always did. I mean, we, um, when we were searching for these locations, we always told them, listen, it's a film about the earth, how we are kind of, you know, not ruining, but it's of course a critical film, but also we promised that there will be no any narration, so whatever people on location tell us, that's the only audio files that we have that we will use. So it's also up to your people to kind of shape the form of the film a little bit. Yeah. And um, we promised them that we will not make a film that makes the audience believe that everybody who is driving a bulldozer or an excavator is an asshole, you know? So that's, and, and we kept this, of course. I think, I think that companies or, or people who decide whether to, to allow a film team into a premises, they, they feel if, if they are kind of tricked or not. And many of those locations that I would have liked to film, they are close to the media because of some other teams before me just being not fair with them, you know? Mm. So you may have one single access like this, but you kind of burn this area for a lot of teams after yourself. Great, thanks. Um, if you could pass the mic to the very front. I'd like to ask a question in between um, concerning the fact that you work without off commentary um, a lot and I think that also changes the way how you can approach a protagonist and how you can kind of keep this promise better than if you would narrate through um, a story with your own um, voice. And then um, you don't, do not only treat the protagonist differently but also the audience. Um, because you give more space for interpretation, for thought, for opinion. Yeah, I mean, I think that, of course, this film is full of commentaries. And, um, of course, um, I have my way of seeing things. And I want, um, but, but I want the audience to, to read this between the lines. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's in the end, it's also more fun for the audience to think for themselves, you know. I think that filmmaking today, I mean, there are so many big questions. You couldn't give an answer within 90 minutes anyway. So it's like with the journalism. Sometimes the right question is, 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 is more important than the answer, actually, you know? And, and I'm trying to, to raise questions and I'm trying to create awareness. But um, each of you will have seen a different film, for sure. All within a certain direction that we try to, to, to prepare. So we offer possible readings which sometimes work, sometimes not. But that's, that's what we do. And in the end, when people, people explain to me what kind of film they saw and it matches kind of what I wanted to do, it's perfect. But it's not necessarily so. With this film, you can, I mean, it's, you can see a film that I believe is full of criticism against our society, of, against our way of living. But in the end, you can also just enjoy watching bulldozers for 90 minutes and it's also fine, you know? So, so we try to pack it really in between the lines and, and each episode has some kind of a, a little story with him, which then in the end, um, sometimes we are, we are more editing those in between, between the line stories than, than the, the images, than the rather, than how should I say, than, than the, the obvious content of the images, you know. We are not only editing images, we are editing feelings and we are editing things that are transported with the images. So you've got layers that you dig into. Yes, through. yes, yes. There are those layers. That's why our editing is so complicated. Yeah. There was a question in front. Uh, hi. Um, I want to go a little before the research because I'm very interested in how you develop your point of view. You have a very special perspective of the things. It's like, like for me, it's, I have seen different films from you. Like you are flying, no? Uh, Many filmmakers, or we are used to make things that 
are very near to us. Maybe that, that has to do with the question of the colleague there about social issues, I don't know. But uh, I have seen, it's like you, you see the big context and make things in the big scale, no? That's why you have to choose different regions in the world or many years. And for me, it's interesting to know how you ca came to this. I, it's something from the childhood. I don't know how, you know? I mean, I know the scientist Zellinger from Austria. He used to see from the window. He was living, I think, in the fifth floor. And the parents had to create something in order to, uh, to leave him because he was wishing too much to see the, from the window the things that if in order not, not to fail, not to, he, I don't know if I, but I, I think maybe it's, it was developed in your youth or, or so, I want to. But it, it talks to what we were discussing before, that you start from a very global perspective going into detail rather than starting off with the detail of being really close to characters. So you start with the configuration of spaces and go into depth. Why? If, if I can add something, I come from, I am from Peru, from Latin America, and I, I see that uh, I live in Europe. European, for example, European people are more, uh, they dare more to make so big things, to, to have so big perspective of the things. That's why I'm very interested how you develop this. It's, it's really an interesting question, you know. Um, I never thought about this, actually. I think, I mean, everybody's trying to understand the world. And I think, I, I, for me, it's easier to, 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 to try to understand generally how human mankind is working. but. I really don't know what... <laughs> but it was always like this. It was not a development in the films well, no. after, mm. but it was always in... As a young boy also, you try to... Uh. Or <laughs> <laughs> this is really interesting. I would have to ask my parents. <laughs> um, I never thought about this, but I, what, what I can tell you, this is... I mean, I started photographing when I was like 14, 15 years old, and I... From that moment on, I use this wide-angle lens because I just like to, you know, I would prefer this image than only one or two faces, simply because there is more to see. And because I always think that the environment is important, it's important to see people in their environment, you know. So, but then again, a photo is not enough. It's like with the World Press photos, they are great, but if you don't have the one sentence below the frame, that explains to the, the circumstances when the photo was taken and what it shows, it's worth nothing. And that's probably something I, I try to achieve with the films. Mm -hmm. This doesn't answer the question. No, no, yes, yes, yes. It's in the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Right next to you and then to, to, to do Yeah, I have a question about um, the protagonists and the because what they say is very, um, often very surprising and um, nothing you would get in like a TV uh, news report. And I um, have the experience that if you put a camera and um, first thing people feel they're like important and now they need to talk like politicians and need to say something very important. So how is your interview style? How long are the interviews you're taking? Um, do you have a special like way of asking questions. And it's different. I mean, the interviews, they don't take that long. I think it's, it's more important when, when preparing the interviews or when asking to, to somebody to, to give an interview, just to take it easy, to tell them, listen, okay, just tell me anything. This is the camera. This is kind of a stage, and you are the actor now, but you are kind of playing yourself, you know? And just tell me what you think. And... Um, the conversation has to be on the eye level. That, that, that's very important. I think so, in that so case... So it's it, like a playful way of... of would yeah, you yeah this, way? it is somehow playful. And um, it's... I mean, with the guy in the film, the one that you saw, he was, this was the first interview on this location. He was the most kind of nervous. It was the, less, the least playful one because he... 
He was okay, but he wasn't really sure what would happen. But after him, after the others saw him, it was getting more and more easy and relaxed. And I mean, those guys, they have something to say. Just nobody asks them. So very often we, we heard that our protagonists were just surprised and happy and they couldn't believe, what, you really came to interview us and not the boss, you know? And then you tell them, yeah, because you are driving this machine, I want to see how you experience this, and then they, they get it. And if they don't feel that they have a reason to be worried, it's usually okay. It was about another question on the very front here. Yeah. <laughs> hey, so my question plays uh, really well with your question as well. Uh, my question is just, what kind of research do you do when deciding what topic you want to work on? Like, do you have a, a process of just learning things and deciding what you want to um, do a movie about? Like, for example, with your movie, Pripyat. Um, like, that is, a, like, that is a, a big thing. That is a big topic. That is a... a like you knew, I'm sure, that it was going to be hard to get the access and all of that. How do you decide you want to work on something? Well, usually I make the film about the topics that I want to see in the cinema. With Pripyat it was the same. I mean, this, this um, reactor accident happened and there was this zone and everybody knew that it is virtually impossible to get in there. Okay. We have to try to get in there, very simple. And then um, in that case, for example, we went to Kiev and we talked to some environmentalists and to the government and to a lot of people. And in the end, we found an old guy who was working as a liquidator in Pripyat. And he, again, was working for the Ukrainian government. And it just turned out that this, um, the Ukrainian government, they they had a, a special commission whose job was to find solutions for what to do with this zone, what to do with Pripyat, and this commission was in, in, in service for some years and they didn't present any results. So our fixer, let's call him like this, proposed to this commission of the Ukrainian government that we could produce this film for them if they grant us the access and then they can show it to the parliament and then they have something to show, you know, and this was a win-win situation for everybody and this, uh, it was like a diplomatic pass, you know, I mean, there were, there were all these checkpoints when you get in and, and with this paper from the government, we could simply move around and do whatever we want. This was just a good luck. Without this, it wouldn't have been possible to shoot this film. Um, yeah, I wanted to make this film because I, I thought, hey, there is a story that needs to be told. And even now, I mean, I just thought, okay, hey, we are, we are so much, we're taking so much from the earth and we are really shaping, shaping the earth. And I, I don't know of any recent movie in the cinemas that really deals with this. So if I wouldn't be interested, I couldn't make a film about it. And many, many, many times people propose topics to me and usually I say no, because it doesn't come from myself, you know. I could never make a film for somebody or something like this, for, for a topic that is not really of interest for myself. I'd like to um, stay with the earth and the movement of the earth for a bit before we open up again. Um, and before we do that, I'd like to see clip number two, please. So yeah, watching um, this scene, but many other scenes in the film as well, you get a quite physical idea of the impact on the material of earth, rock, soil, and um, in all the episodes, as different as they might be and also as different locations might be, um, the violent act of intrusion into the material is a topic also raised by the workers on, on site. Um, as well as you mentioned before, you have the Italian worker in the marble mine who is talking about the physical effect his work has on him. And you have the same um, with the American worker um, when he talks about riding the bulldozer and how he really has to fight it and how when his friends ask him, they think it's really easy riding around in the sand whereas he's like, and you can see his physical condition with his shoulder hanging down that there really is a resistance there. So you investigate people, but you also very deeply investigate material and machines, and they get protagonists um, as well. Um, what does it mean to you? Yeah. 
the machine. The machine and the material, and um, well, how, how does it get a lot of space like that? And, um, I think there is, there's a lot of aesthetics in it. And I think that, um, how should I say? Um, one of my approaches to this topic was also that I know how to operate these machines. I know to how to use a digger, and I did this some time in my life. And that was maybe one, one key for talking to all these operators on I-level, because we were just, you know, I know what you're doing, and so come on. This helped a lot. And um, yeah, I was, um, it was important for me to, for example, to work in, on mines and on locations that, that really use this heavy equipment. The equipment where you basically, you have two joysticks and you have not to do anything to make a big shovel move into the earth and to dig it out because it's a way of losing contact. When you use it with your own small shovel like this, you know, when, when you're working on the ground, it's different. But once you have this really heavy equipment, it's, it also kind of symbolizes the, the estrangement of us towards the soil and towards the earth because we don't really get in contact anymore. We do a lot of really a big transformation of, of, of the surface of the planet, but nobody has to sweat, you know, nobody has to really work on it. You just have to put fuel in it and have two joysticks and that's it basically. So I found it simply interesting and just to, and, and it, yeah, and, and uh, I don't even know exactly what to say, but I thought that this is really one of the main topics of the film, the machinery touching the soil and working with the soil. So it was a lot about the dimension of the, and the heaviness of the impact also. Because, yeah. he, for example, in the Brenner um, episode, you have this really big machine that only needs a little, of, a little bit of preparation to then operate, and it actually does the whole work of doing a tunnel and human beings are just there to get the material out of the way and to, to guide its way. And then even sometimes you have the feeling that the machines move more organically um, or naturally than the human beings do. So is this objectifying and sub like this turning around of subjectification and objectification a topic for you or is it just something that came about observing? Well, I mean, I was surprised in, in, in California when you have, there's this location where lots and lots of diggers and trucks and scrapers are on, they're like, it's, it's, it's like a ballet, they are dancing, you know. There is not very much space and they all do their work and they all know exactly where to go and what to do. And of course it's the drivers doing this. But when you look at it from a distance, it looks like robots and they are just doing all the work. So, I mean, for example, we, we we really decided not to go to any um, smaller mines in some developing countries where a lot of the work would be done manually because this is a completely different topic. I really wanted to, to kind of um, stay with the mines and with this high-end equipment which makes it very easy for the, for the human being to, to, to work with the earth. So the choreography of movement is important somehow. But as you see, the choreography of the movement of the machines, as in the very back, as you say, you, you, you really get that this the, feel of dancing. That there even is some yeah. beauty in it. Yeah. Of yeah. course. Yesterday you yeah. said, um, I think it was wundervoller Wahnsinn in German. It's like a wonderful madness, um, which also brings me to the ambivalence of the whole thing, because obviously you said before you want to make a critical comment, but you don't want to do it by um, telling people what you find problematic about, but by giving space in the image to observe for the audience um, what might be problematic about it and also um, not sparing out the ambivalence of beauty and also of pleasure and joy in this work. Yeah. It, it is very ambivalent and um, I mean even now when the film is finished, I, I, whatever we see in the film for me is ambivalent because of course you might think it's, it's crazy what the humans are doing but when you think about it, I mean for, for all of these sites there is a reason. This is, um, whatever we do to, to our planet, we do it with a reason, because we need the materials, we need to live somewhere, we need to transport our, our goods, and that's the question that is basically raised, and that um, all this ambivalence is what, what the audience, I think, takes away with the film. It's not a film that says, hey, whatever we see here is wrong. It's just a film that says, hey, look at what we are doing, and kind of maybe not change things, but be aware of what is going on. 
Is there any questions to that? Um, I see one in the very front and then one, two, three, four in the back. So maybe let's start here on the right. Could you raise your hand again so we know where to throw the mic? <laughs> I was wondering how much do you interfere with what is going on in front of the camera or do you have to interfere at all? Like also in terms of how you find your framing, for example, in the um, um, take that we saw with the workers talking in the morning, um, do you sometimes interfere in terms of saying, oh, could you move like to this part of the mine in order to get the better shot or do you try to stay as invisible as possible? I try to interfere as little as possible. I mean, especially with these um, workers, every morning they gather and they have this kind of conversation. And two days I witnessed it and so I understood how it works because it's the same everywhere. And, and, and in the end, this is a combination of the three other morning shots that we had. Once we had a ladder for the, for the, higher, um, for the higher total picture that we did from the, from the back. Next morning we did the closer ones. Um, it's, I prefer to understand, uh, understand how things work and then um, frame, but sometimes, of course, I mean, where, where, where does the interfering start, where does it stop? In the digital age, of course, you do, do a lot of interference in some way. You remove microphones in the frame, you, I don't know, like all this, there are a lot of, 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 of images from a, from a drone, which were supposed to be really stable, of course they're not really stable, and then people like Matza, they make it stable. All this is, it's, of course you're altering images, you know, but in the end it's just the way to try to present them in a, in a, in a most natural way. Yeah. No, I was wondering if you, uh, that's, uh, you answered that already, if you observed the scene a day before and then you decide, okay, which angle do I want to use in order to say what I want to say? Sometimes a day before, just sometimes on location. I mean, the good thing on these locations is that many things, they, they are repeating and repeating and repeating. Mm. So you watch it once or twice and then you know where to put the camera and you can even change the camera. And too much interference wouldn't have been possible anyway. You couldn't stop these machines. They are there to run and not to just... I mean, of course, you stopped them, for example. We did some, some shots of the drivers on the trucks, so we had to, to flag some of the big trucks out, and they were standing for 20 minutes while we were mounting the camera. But all these scenes, they were there. They were given. We were just trying to, 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 to translate them into the cinema. Yeah. Thank you. Um, hi, um, I'm, I'm a little interested in the business side of uh, documentary filmmaking. So, um, have you reached a point where you could say, uh, from the time when you conceive the idea to the time when you finish the film, how much time you would allocate for something to do something like this? Is it something of um, of importance to you, or do you just go out and say, okay, it doesn't matter how much time it takes. I just go out. I have an idea. However, it, it, it actually goes, and um, tied into this question is um, how many then do you have to make a year to be able to run yourself and the business? Because you, you, you uh, she mentioned that you have a production company and is your sole focus on documentary films to sustain yourself? This is what you kind of live from, so to say, in that kind of way? And um, yeah, you understand my question? I understand <laughs> your question. And um, the answer is very frustrating. <laughs> because you, you, you simply couldn't live for films like this. If, you only, if I would only make those films that I'm doing, I, I could live off, off what I'm earning as a director, but for like, supporting a family or something, it, in a normal way, this wouldn't be enough, I think. I have this production company, which I'm running with three other colleagues, and so I have this kind of a double income, which gives me the, the freedom to take my time when I'm doing a documentary, but um, it is a, it's, it's a tough environment to live from. That's what I really have to say, especially when television is involved. I mean, there are some, some stations that still are willing to pay some fair amount of money, but basically, I mean, what, what the television pays is going down and down and down, and they expect more and more for the same amount of money, and then you're forced to have a co-production with many different partners, and then you have to deliver many different versions, and 
have a lot of um, commissioning editors who all are somehow important and have something to say and you have to edit so many versions. This is not the case with my films. This is really, I'm aware of the fact that this is a privileged situation because they are funded by cinema money mostly and then with just the Austrian television and usually it's Dreisat or Arte, so this is okay. But I know that with other projects that we produce, it's, it's basically money is getting less and less or let's say the money that the TV stations are willing to pay is getting less and less. Um, uh, but it's not that you have to deliver less and less quality. So. Um, it is, to sum it up, it is a tough job, yes. That's it, I leave this industry. <laughs> um, yeah, Matt, let's move it to the back here. On, yeah. <laughs> um, so you work on parallel projects at the same time? That was also one part of the question that um, yeah, I was always. wanting to, yeah. I mean, when, when I'm finishing a film, another research has to start already. Otherwise, the, the period would just be too long because usually it takes like four years, sometimes even a little bit more from the very first idea and from the very first steps of financing until you really finish the movie. So you, just, you have to keep working, you know. And you do indeed long-term um, documentaries as well. Um, I'm just thinking about Über die Jahre, where you really followed a, a space and a location for a long time, or was that an exec exceptional case? That was an exception, and it was never meant to be like this. This was just a chance that we had because we started shooting with several, I mean, Über die Jahre is a film about um, uh, a mill, basically, a, or what, what do you call it? A mill? A, a, mill. a, a yeah. mill in, in, in a very remote part of Austria and it was very clear that this mill would close down at some point and I wanted to make a film about um, the process when people get unemployed and what happens to them. So we started shooting with six of these employees, basically the, the six last employees, and after a year or two, the mill closed down and we continued to work with them and basically we, the story was told at that point, but um, we just kind of got friends with them and, and we also had some, in some way it was important for them that they would come again and again and we visited them year after year and the good thing was that this was also a film that we produced with the um, film funding money, so there was only the Austrian television involved, and they said, okay, we are really not in a hurry, meaning we are not waiting for this to broadcast it immediately. So they just allowed us to extend the shooting year after year, and in the end we could work like this for 10 years, and we, we followed our protagonists over a time span of 10 years, which is totally un unusual and uncommon, and if, if you would have started the project with an approach like this. It would have been impossible to finance it because usually TV stations, they want to, to have a result after some years because they, they paid for it, so they need to broadcast it. And I guess they were waiting for a different result than the one... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, so that, that, but that, in that way, I have to say, it was really pretty cool of the Austrian commissioning editors just to tell us year after year, come on, yeah, I'm not asking any questions, just continue, you know? And this made this uh, unique story possible, but other than that, it's, it's, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be possible. Mm. Hi, I was wondering, have you always operated your camera yourself? And just about sort of your relationship to that, or has anybody else also filmed something? Or when you interview, for example, in the San Fernando Valley, do you always, you put up the camera and then you stand beside, and just about that process, and second question, I was interested in your dummy scripts for uh, funders and TV scripts and d dummy locations, not dummy scripts. But sort of, do you kind of say, okay, I have this relationship with this commissioning editor, there's a trust relationship, but then, oh yeah, we have to apply to this fund, so let's write this and this and this so that they get what they need to hear just so we can start. How, can you describe that process? So do you in invest less time or give them a bit more of this social critique that they maybe want to read and make it more explicit and in the end it's much more between the lines? I hope you understand my question, just the process. Yeah. Of, mm -hmm. No, I mean, by now I think they know that they get the critique between the lines. And Dreisat, um, this television that we usually work with, they want it like this because they know what they will get. And um, I mean, it's also, you know, at least the film is screened on a Berlinale, so it's kind of high-end and they are happy with the result. And they, but um, it is like I told you before, I mean, it's more about the topic, it's more about the general questions. Uh, do we want to support Gaia Halter making a film about this topic? 
and then there are some locations. And there is something to read, but everybody knows that this is interchangeable. And about the other question about this, I was always operating a camera ever since because I was working as a photographer and for me it's just like I know exactly what I want. So it's the, the camera is for me it's really like a tool. It's like like a caterpillar for somebody else, you know. It's just um, I use it because I know what result I want to get and and um, I wouldn't like to work with any camera operator because or let's say the other way around, I think any camera operator working with me would be very bored because there is just nothing to do, you know, because I would tell him exactly how to place the camera and so it's easier to do it alone. And, and during the interviews, yeah, I mean, I ask, usually ask the people to, to look into the lens and I'm hiding exactly behind the lens so there is no eye contact, so they really have to talk into the lens, into the audience. This is not so hard, the harder part is to kind of make a small training to tell them, okay, and when you finish your answer, you still look at the lens and don't do like this, was it good, you know? This, is, this usually happens, um, but yeah, but, but, but basically it's, it is like this, it's really, it's person, camera, myself. Yeah. Uh I would like to uh, continue on the questions uh, uh, with the technical aspects, uh, uh, but I wanted to uh, say also that I liked uh, the topic yesterday that you um, pointed out uh, that uh, every driver of these caterpillars and so on, uh, even himself, uh, was kind of against that what they are doing there. And so it uh, made, a, made it a kind of... Uh, uh, senseless what they're doing in a way <laughs> regarding the target what they're doing and hurting our earth in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in that way. Well I mean I don't think it's senseless I, I think that they, they just they are aware of what they are doing they know that they're doing it for a purpose and they know that our way of living our society asks for this to be done but they are also aware of the damage that they do because they see it with their own eyes they are the first to see it this is yes, but I, but, but I think it was a, a, a great important, a po important point for the film that this, these drivers themselves uh, are saying these words, I mean these sentences against what they, what they are doing, that they, were, uh, that they are aware of what they are uh, doing there. Uh, with yeah, and the, the nature and it is true. And I mean, in, the, in the beginning, I was surprised, you know, by wow, it's a caterpillar driver and we are getting a really sophisticated answer. But then I thought to myself, am I stupid to believe that somebody who's operating a caterpillar should not be able to give a sophisticated answer? You know, I mean, there I mean, are people like, like all of us. Yes, and but it was a kind of uh, surprising uh, it, it is. It, it is surprising, but it, it shouldn't be surprising. It's just surprising because we intellectual people wouldn't <laughs> expect this. But this is our <laughs> problem and not their problem. Yes, and the other question is, uh, uh, well, uh, the, the um, technical development of uh, cameras, for example, I, the impression, my impression was that it helps a lot uh, to that what you try to, uh, to do together uh, um, with pictures because it was yeah, kind of uh, really high uh, uh, re resolution. I think you shot on 4K. And uh, so it was a uh, yeah it was great to follow all these small uh, things uh, which were go uh, going on in the in the picture. These uh, caterpillars which were in the total shots, kind of very small in the in the corners. And so on. it was uh, great to watch it. And uh, at least uh, I wanted to know how many cameras you crashed during the blast. <laughs> yeah, I mean. The film was mainly shot with a red epic camera on 4K, or actually on 5K, but the resolution in the film is 4K in the end, because the red epic is actually not that sharp. Um, but, um, and yes, and for the blastings, we, we, we bought three kind of action cams, and we were always expecting them not to survive, and, and they all survived until today, which is amazing. But of course, you would never shoot this with a big camera especially the, the, the other explosion in, 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 the, in, the, in the tunnel. 
No, I was, I was, I was surprised that we could really, that they, I mean, we lost our lights. This is not the scene that you saw. There is another scene that we shot in the tunnel. So the lights, um, before the lights, we, we put a very thick uh, glass, which was, which was supposed to be tank bullet safe. I don't know what. But actually, the lights, they were really completely destroyed. But the cameras, they just fell down, and then they were covered with mud. But they were still alive. OK, thanks. So just briefly to follow up on that question, um, how much do you intervene with sound design and grading uh, in post-production in those kind of scenes? Yeah, I mean, of course, we do a good grading. I mean, that's the thing. I, w I think it is a vital part of the way that this movie works that the audience can really dive into a location, you know? That's why I use this wide-angle lens, and that's why the shots are standing for quite a long time, so that the audience really does not only see, but also feel. You see, you hear, and then you start feeling, and then you become part of, of this location that you usually don't have access to. And um, to make this happen, I think it is nowadays simply important to do all this on a, on a, on a technical high level, because that's what people expect in the cinema. I, I have discussions with, with the sound designers and, and in the studio because way back when I was doing my first films, you would just try to record the sound on location as good as possible, and that was it, you know? And nowadays you have, I mean, this film was, was mixed in Dolby Atmos. You have, I don't know, 72 loudspeakers all around and above you, and, and they all have to be filled somehow. And, and for me, I, I sometimes have the feeling it's a bit too much because I say, hey, listen, this is not according to the original sound that we had. But then, but then they say, yeah, but this is not true because when you're recording, you use this one directional microphone and you try to record the sound of the person as clear as possible. And of course, there's a lot of noise around that you just don't record because you want to record this voice and you want to have this as clean as you get. So what we're trying is to recreate how it might have sounded in the location all around. I can accept this. And um, so the approach in the sound design was to use as much as original sound bits that we recorded on the same location, maybe some minutes before or after or whatever. And if um, some more sound is added, it should be really original sound. So um, Florian, the sound designer, he was really, when he saw the, the type of the caterpillar, he was trying to find exactly this engine in the sound archives and so on and so on. So there is, there is authenticity and, and we try to, to use this Dolby Atmos system, but on a very low key level. So it should create an atmosphere, but it should not be an effect. Thanks. Hi, I just wanted to follow up on something that you talked about in terms of your development and how you choose your protagonist and your spaces. So you said you want to stay very curious and interested, so you actually don't want to know too much before you go in. But how do you sort of strike that balance between not wanting to know too much and making a really strong decision about what would be a, you know, a very compelling protagonist and space? So for example, it was surprising to you that some of the drivers said what they said about being senseless. Did you know that before going into that particular space? And um, does that make it a lot sort of richer that you found that out? But what if you never knew that they would have said that? So how do you strike that balance so that you are still interested, but also you make decisions? Yeah. I mean, of course you have to make decisions, but I think the most important thing is to, to generally trust in the fact that in the end it will be good. And even if you make the wrong decision, it might be good for something else. So this is, of course, stressful. Yeah. Um, and there is no rule, you know. What I'm also doing is I, I, I encourage my whole team, sound engineers, everybody who's on location, and tell them, listen, I'm shooting. I Basically, I'm looking at the viewfinder. You have your eyes around. Tell me what you see. Tell me what you think is interesting. And it's, it's more like a collaborative work on the location. And, and while I'm shooting, sometimes a production manager or a fixer is talking to somebody else in the background. And, and that's how information is scattered. And then we just you try to react, you know. But 
I think, I mean, ideally, within those few days of shooting on a location, something is building up by itself. And then you just have to, I mean, it's, it's a lot of opportunities and you have to pick some. You will never know whether it was the right one or not. But what would, the, what would be the other option? And what about your ideas? Where do they come from? And how do you sort of figure out what makes a good film versus some other form? There is not really a rule to this. <laughs> I'm a teacher of documentaries, so I'm always trying to help them find their ideas. So what advice might you give them? My advice is if you don't have ideas, don't make films. <laughs> but they still want to. <laughs> Talking about ideas and different films, maybe before we go on with questions from the audience, um, let's have a look into one of your earlier works, um, Our Daily Bread, Unser täglich Brot, um, about food industries and also large-scale technology in our food industries. So please, clip number three. Um, it's a film where you take a look at different production chains, chains also um, within different um, areas of the food industries. Maybe um, you want to go into that. Uh, we had a pre-chat on the phone and I asked you about what kind of work could respond to the overall topic of mistakes and um, how to feel better and how to learn out of mistakes or how new chances and opportunities come about with mistakes. Um, yeah, please explain. <laughs> Well, I mean, our daily bread, the way that the film finally is, is that there is no interviews. It's just moments like this, and it's, um, this wasn't meant to be like this. When we applied for the funding and also with the television stations, it was more like a conventional documentary. And until the very end of the shooting, we shot interviews with people working in these environments and talking to them in a similar way like I was talking to the excavator drivers. But um, it's, it never worked, it never worked, the film never worked. It was just in some way boring, so it, uh, we were close to a big fail. And then we thought, okay, why doesn't it work? And, and I think the reason was that, for example, in this uh, chicken hatchery, yes, we were talking to the people and they explained to us what they were doing but, and what they think about, and there was some criticism in it anyway, but they could only talk about their field of business because they have never seen anything else. And the film consists of maybe, I don't know, 20 locations like this. So the audience in the cinema is kind of overwhelmed because they see, they get insights of an industry which nobody got before and which not even our protagonists have gotten before because they know nothing except their daily work, of course. So this led to the fact that somehow the audience had so many questions, but none of these protagonists could deliver it because the audience, by, by the moment that they saw the film, they knew more about the world than all protagonists did because, and this was simply not fair towards the protagonists and it was boring for the audience. So, and then in the very last moment, we decided, okay, let's try to kick out all of the interviews because that was the response that we got from the, from the, from the test screenings. Usually when we're editing a film, we go to the cinema and we invite some friends or colleagues and just ask them, okay, have a look and tell us what you think. And they all said, well, the interviews are boring, but the rest is interesting. That was how this um, idea was born, to really make the whole film without commentary, without words, without interviews. And of course, you need to communicate this with the broadcasters and tell them, listen, there is a slight change in dramaturgy. Yeah? And, <laughs> and this again was Dreisart, and, and the commissioning editor was really cool. And she, she said, OK, if you think this is the better movie, just do it. But um, you really need strong partners for a decision like this. But in a way, it still corresponds to your structure of episodes that have very strict formal um, rules that they stick to, especially now with the production chains. You have a movement that starts here and ends there. And um, it has a very large effect on what actually comes out as a product. So, yeah. Maybe it's an example on how it, it ended up being a chance or luck to do so, no? It was a big luck. Yeah. I mean, some, some of the fails, they, they, they make things much, much better in the end. So that's what I, what I meant before. I mean, just don't be afraid of failing. There's always a 50-50 chance. Maybe you lose a location or maybe it's getting much better. 
And anyway, you have to lose locations because you can't lose, use all of them. So nothing to be afraid of. Um, there were a few questions in the back before we move back to the front. Um, before, yeah, you can start. Uh, I just want to know how you know when the research is over. Um, and maybe also how you know when to end the film or how to end the film. Well, I mean, the research is basically never over unless the money is finished. And okay, so when the money is finished, that's <laughs> the answer. And maybe not even then, because if, if, if there is not enough material for the film, then you have to find some other solutions. Um, and I mean, a film like Earth, you could continue shooting forever. But um, you have to come to a point where you think it's okay. And usually there is a festival waiting and this helps you making these decisions. <laughs> but do you have a point where you feel like, oh, I think I have an ending? Yeah, which, which I didn't have with this Earth movie for a very long time. And to end this movie was the most complicated part, to find an ending, because it's episode after episode. And really, I mean, it could be a two hour film, it could be a four hour film, it could be a one hour film. So it had to be a clear ending and it had to be a logical ending it had to be something a little bit different which makes the audience understand that the end is coming um, this was not so easy with this film but a film is just as good as its end you know because this the last minutes when you chase the audience out of the cinema they are most decisive in some way of how they remember the film yeah uh, like as a follow-up to this question, uh, I'd like you to talk about the structure. Uh, I haven't seen the film, but I, I guess it's you know made of these different episodes in different places all over the world, as you said. And uh, yeah, I wonder how you, what's the entrance point to the film? How do you find that? And how do you build up something towards this uh, this ending you are talking about now? What what is it that is leading you or what kind of rules or logic do you follow? Because I can see how like the scenes, they could be interchangeable in time in these kind of films. So maybe you can tell us about it a little bit. Yeah, I mean, in that case, we should also ask the editor who is really contributing to this a lot. But um, I mean, I think it is important that in the beginning of the movie, the audience understands why do we see this movie. Uh, in that case, there is just a quote from a study saying there is one, one, one frame of a very empty landscape somewhere in California, the desert, and then there you have the um, two titles popping in, the one saying, okay, the nature is moving like 60 tons of, 60 million tons of earth every day, and then the second title says, the humans are moving 160 million tons of every day. I think this is enough to understand why for the next two hours you have to see big excavators moving the dirt. Without this sentence, this simply wouldn't work because nobody would understand to, why should I watch this, you know? So I think it is important to, to, guide, to guide the audience into the film with some kind of quote or some, or some or some, some, some opening image that just explains a lot and raises a lot of questions that are later on answered. And then, yes, we had these seven episodes, and first of all, you can randomly just place them, but of course, every episode has its own topic, its, its own dramaturgical elements, and they have to add up, you know? So, and then you start balancing, see which is good as the first episode. The, the California episode was the first one and how it might work. And then, then again, we went to many locations to reshoot some things because we knew now, okay, Hungary is episode number three. It's good like this, but there is something missing because they need to move and so on. And then we went there again and we're shooting. It's, that's why I said for me, shooting and researching and editing, it's really like a, like a spiral all the time. It's, it's, it's a permanent communication and brainstorming. You get the feeling that there is a dramaturgic curve of criticism that builds up in, in the final decisions because um, in the beginning it's about um, what is being moved, how it is being moved, and then we get further into um, this controversy 
CIF project of the Brenner um, Tunnel, which um, for Austrians and Germans and Italians is, I think, also connoted to a discourse that is not only, um, well, to critical discourse, and then further we go to the um, reactor side, where it's about the atomic waste, and in the very end you have the First Nation people in Canada really critically commenting on the side that you don't even enter. So. I mean, we were talking about the subtle criticism and also um, the ambivalence, but then again, in the uh, configuration of the single episodes, I find you do take a very clear standing. Yeah, but um, this is something that has to be created. You know, that's, um, as I told you before, it's, it's very easy to edit images, but what we need to edit is the is the content, the between the line content, the feelings that are transported with these Im images. And this relates to the next episode. And, and mm. of course, the cuts have to be working on, a, on an optical way. But it's even in the same way important that mm, the editing of the structure and of the feelings, they have to be correct. And so basically you're, you're editing on at least two levels. Before we open up for a very last round of questions, I'd like to show clip four as the last impression of Earth also. Um, the reason why I wanted to um, have a look at this before we close is, um, for me, it brings together these topics of subtle humor, ambivalence, and also the formal structure that you follow. Um, and you can see how like humorous scenes and also very ambivalent and also maybe difficult scenes can be so close to one another and then again I find it very interesting also and lucky to to have that so close and so dense yeah um, maybe you want to share thoughts about it or maybe someone on, um, from the audience wants to add to it audience audience <laughs> uh, audience in the back and then in the front um, my question is kind of related to uh, the one where you wanted to ask your parents. Um, and I think this is actually a, a good example right now. It's really weird. There's a really strong delay with the mic from back here. Um, sorry. It's really... um, can you hear me like this? But, yeah, we hear you perfectly. Just go ahead. Okay. Um, no, but with the mic. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's weird. Um, so... Uh, the question before, that your approach of thinking is maybe... I can relate to it a lot, but this question, this type of question, I kind of hear often that you said you're interested in how the world works. And basically, I have experienced very often in Germany, for example, that you get a question back, yeah, but that's not a film. That's not, like, that's journalism, that's social science, whatever. Um, give us a small story, something small. And there's, like, a lot of bias against this I would maybe you could call it universalist or something. This general interest on how why things are the way they are, and in the example right now, I like very much. I like I lot, like that a lot because I thought that, for example, showing a type of speech is something that you would normally not do. That's reserved for news, and when you tell somebody, yeah, I want to use speeches in my film that people make in places, but I'm not really interested in just showing the speech, I want to show the context. It's the context that really tells the story. That often, I have the feeling a lot of people shut down. They all say, no, no, but that's maybe, yeah, that's like for a 20 minute TV piece. Like you can show the speech. Like it just doesn't um, get to the other, like you know, you can't communicate. I have trouble communicating those ideas. And I was curious how that is for you, whether you've built, let's say, such a strong brand with what you're doing, or people know you, and they know what they get, that you don't get into these problems? Or maybe you can't relate to the question at all? I don't know. Uh, well, it's, if it's even a question. Uh, yeah, I, I see the point. I mean, I think there is also the difference between this film and, and maybe some, some television story about the same topic is also the style. It's a strong aesthetic aspect. I think this is what... That's why, that's why it works in the cinema. And that's how it is basically sold 
because in the end, I mean, for, for me, it's hard to say because I really don't feel as an artist. I feel as a worker. But many people consider this as a piece of art in some way because it is very aesthetically filmed and it's a stable shots and it's Geierhalter as a brand, blah, blah, blah. I don't care shit about this, but that's how it works. And um, I know exactly that if somebody of you would propose the completely same project, it would be very tough to finance it because um, commissioning editors simply wouldn't know how it looks like and you can film the same scene in very many different ways. And the other thing is, I mean, there is not too much space for this. One or two years, two films like this in the cinema per year, that's okay. But um, I, I see your point. I see your point, and I don't have a solution. <laughs> there was a question very front, and the, oh, maybe we go to the back and then to the front. Sorry, he was raising his hand very early, very much earlier. Thank you. Before. Well, now this fell apart. <laughs> Hope it's okay. Um, well, first of all, I just wanted to say uh, thank you for making these movies about these topics. I find it very um, important that this is sort of uh, being brought to people's awareness, these sort of very obscure industries that you're dealing with. Um, so I have two questions. The first is, it seems like you have a um, very strong thematic you're sort of working on. Do you already know what the next chapter is and do you want to share it with us? Um, and maybe I'll just do the second question, then you can choose the order of answering them. <laughs> um, the second question is a little bit about, um, well, maybe exactly the question of this awareness. And you were, um, you were talking a bit before about how you gain access to these um, sites that you visit. Um, and maybe you can talk a bit, about, a bit more about this process and if it's difficult for you. Um, I wanted to ask because in, in my personal um, experience of dealing um, with like mines and pits and stuff like this, it's actually not, they're sort of notoriously known for being very difficult to access because it's this, it's this sort of obscure, like literally underworld that we kind of hide away from the view of common society. But, um, but in my personal experience, it's actually not very hard to gain access if you come in and, and uh, and ask for it from the part of the mine, more so it's maybe the, the public who is kind of wanting to close their eyes and actually not have the access. Um, so I was, I was kind of wondering, where do you meet most obstruction in this dealing with these themes? Is it from the, the, the companies and the sites that you're dealing with? Is it maybe from um, the media channels you're going through, or is it even from your, from the public or the audience that watch the movies? I'm not sure I got the end. I was just wondering, like, um, you, you, were t you were saying that in, in order to being able to make these movies, you have to, of course, to gain access to these yeah. sites, which I imagine is maybe difficult. Maybe you could talk a bit more about this, how easy it is to gain the access. And then I was just saying, in my personal experience, it's not so much a question of the minds um, being very closed off or hard to get access to. Rather, it's a question of um, people not wanting to look at it. They don't actually want to see what's going on there because it's sort of a little bit a dirty secret that we all live yeah, with. Yeah, that's what I experienced. I mean, for us, it was very hard to get this access. I don't think that there is literally any mine on the world that did not receive an email from us during the last three years asking for permission to film. Mm -hmm. And then in the end it was like two or three locations that allowed us, you know. And of course there's a reason. There's always a reason. I think that these, especially the mining companies, they, they are afraid of the bad press, maybe with some reason. And for sure for them it's the easier way not to let anybody in. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just an easy way out, you know. I mean, they can't control all these YouTube videos of some drivers filming on site anyway, but at least they want to control the official channels. And it's also, I think, that just within these companies, which are big and there's a lot of money involved, just nobody wants to be responsible for taking decision to let a film team in, in case that in the end the result is bad for the, co for the reputation of the company. Mm -hmm. So it's just people tend to be less and less brave in some way, you know? Yeah, so do you think that has to do also sort of with the 
like you said before, the scale we're dealing with. So you, you can sit and move joysticks and make a huge impact, but you don't really feel responsible for it because you're just moving the sticks. Like this distance you're talking about that no one actually wants to get. Well, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't think that the people who decide whether to allow a film crew to enter the premises or not, they, they don't think that far. Mm -hmm. They just read film and they think, and they just danger, see. danger. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it's very simple, you know, and of course there are these kind of movies that are really, um, I mean, I'm trying to be fair to everybody, to the drivers, to the companies, to the sites, <laughs> to society in the end, because it's us, you know, um, but it's easy to make a film blaming oil sand mining, you know, that's what probably every filmmaker who goes there does anyway, so in some way I have some understanding that they are just pissed off in some way, but um, it's, it's, what I can say, it is really getting harder to get access to this kind of... There are so many parallel worlds in our world, like with the food industry. I mean, except the people who work there, people don't usually see this. But it happens every day, and whenever we, we eat our chicken curry, it comes from a hatchery like this, you know? And um, again, with this film, it was... We asked so many companies throughout Europe to to let us in and then in some, I don't know why this Polish company said yes please come, you know. It's, it's also a matter of good or bad luck sometimes. Mm -hmm. a very, very short question because we have to stop. Um, in the very front I know you've been waiting for quite a while. No, oh, here on the right. <laughs> Um, I was wondering with how you deal with existential anguish with all these topics. With what? With what? Existential anguish with dealing with these topics, and in, in particular, um, you know, you were talking about ambivalence and not necessarily wanting people to act once they've seen one of your films. Um, I actually find your films often more inspiring to action than maybe more campaigny documentaries. Uh, but so I wonder, do you see yourself? Do you hope that these films might sort of, in some way, inspire? people towards asking for political change or do you see yourself as recording the world as it is now for whatever is left of humanity in a hundred years time or where, where do you see yourself on that scale? It's both, it's both. I mean, in some way I, I, I see this as really as documents of our present, you know, and I, whenever I, I make a film, I also think about this being part of the archives for future generations so they can see what we did back like 100 years ago or something, you know? So I try to make films that somehow pretend to be objective, but I know that they are not. And I know that in the end, by simply showing, you can achieve much more than, than by telling people what to do, because people don't want to be told what to do. So I, I get this response quite often that people come and say, okay, what, what can we do now? I don't know what you can do, but you can think about what you can do. That's something, you know? Um, so I, I don't believe that films can change the world, but maybe a lot of films can change the world a little bit. What a beautiful ending. Thank you for this very last question. Thank you for being here and thank you for listening for such a long time. Thank you.